but yeah, I hope everyone is doing well with this lockdown. I'm pretty stoked for this for this event. Um, I run a I run an event or co-run an event up here called the Small Home Expo in Vancouver, Canada, where I live. And um, obviously, that's not going to happen this year. So um, it's uh, it's awesome that the guys have organised this this festival online. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk today. I'll just go through what I'm going to chat about quickly. Um, and these are just kind of the, um, as Paula Laporte would say in her book, uh, prescriptions for a healthy home and, and the way that I've seen it after building whatever, 50 or something homes. Um, so we'll talk about these things. Uh, my background is actually my first trade was an electrician. Um, and then I traveled over to London and worked as a carpenter there and then came back to Australia where I'm from, started flipping houses, blah, blah, blah. And then ended up uh, marrying a Canadian, moved to Canada, was doing some house flipping here and some commercial work. And then I got really sick and I'd always had skin issues in the form of uh, eczema. And I had this toxic shock event and I'm, my wife said not to put the photo up because it's a little bit uh, um, triggering for some people. But uh, essentially, I there was a two-part paint on one of the job sites and my face exploded into Freddy Krueger-style picture and ended up in hospital. And then after that, any small uh, exposure to, to VOCs, paint, kind of usually paint, um, then my skin would crawl and my body would go try and go back into this toxic event to protect itself. Um, so that flipped things around for me a little bit um, as far as me uh, as far as me the materials I used, the kind of jobs I did. So I went into natural building and was working with some amazing natural builders up here in the Pacific Northwest and and then through that, someone of someone asked me if I could build a non-toxic tiny house house for them. Then I built that, and then you move into a space, and that's what happens. So that's my background. That's why I'm here. Um, and so let's that first tiny house that I built was was when I started getting into like the real nuts and bolts of what are natural materials or non-toxic materials, the lightweight. Um, as I started building more, it, it, it was really apparent that it's a non-toxic home is different for everybody. Um, some of my clients are EMF sensitive. Talk about that. Um, fibromyalgia seems to be a really common one. I work with uh, a couple of people who have got Lyme disease. So trying to trying to build a home that has the least amount of ingredients as possible that you've already had a chance to test on yourself, which is a hard part at the start if you've already got some existing allergies or sensitivities um, before you just engage a builder to build something is really a good idea to test the materials and be clear about what those things are that you're impacted by. And then having the least amount of materials is a good idea because then if you are reacting to something, then you've only got, let's say five to 10 um, materials that you can say that's triggering me. Um, but a healthy home ideally is something that can um, keep your keep your health at a, at a neutral level so that when you come home, you've got something that you can relax into. Uh, what else? Yeah, and then I guess the other the other thing for a healthy home for some people, maybe they don't have maybe you don't have sensitivities or, or allergies or anything like that, but you've got your your politics, you want to do eco or sustainable, both of which um, I've got question marks on this slide because they're kind of buzzwords. I mean, sustainable for some people is buying a takeaway Starbucks coffee every day. For me, that's not sustainable. And then a lot of the stuff that I do in my design, the first, my first point of contact for design is permaculture. And sustainability is in business might be a triple bottom line of, of uh, profit, people, planet, profit and permaculture's third one is sharing the surplus and the difference between profit and sharing the surplus is worlds apart and i think where our where our planet needs to heal 
salvage upcycle upcycle i'll uh, i'll talk about that at the end i think just looking at the time i'm going to have to plow through these uh one of the things that i notice almost every tiny home uh doesn't have that i incorporate is this and i'm not sure if you can see my mouse let's see I used to do a quarter inch, so I had to change it. We do a half inch air gap between the metal trailer frame and the subfloor. And so the way that I do that, and this image may not show in the most clarity, it's a little bit hard, but the ribs of the trailer, I usually have at the bottom. And then that leaves space uh, from the ribs at the bottom of the trailer to the frame um, where I'll put subfloor attached to the trailer frame. And between the wood and the metal, I use a sill gasket or a, or a foam gasket. And then I'll have that subfloor sticking up a half inch above the top of the frame. And then I'll install my subfloor, the plywood subfloor. Now what that creates is an air gap, which means that we don't have thermal bridging between cold metal on the outside and a warm subfloor on the inside. That metal is going to transfer moisture. That's just what it does. Um, and so what I want to do is make sure that moisture does not touch the wood of my subfloor because moisture in wood equals mold and mold is the enemy. A little bit here on thermal bridging as well, steel studs versus wood. I see it. I've, I've been attending the conference all weekend and it's been awesome. And the steel stud versus wood thing is, is for sure steel stud is lightweight, but it does have a thermal bridge. So if it's done right, it can work for sure. And if you really want to use spray foam, then it would have to be into a steel stud, not wood. Um, so the idea with steel studs is that you'd thermally break uh, your, your heat transfer from the outside or your cold transfer before the stud, and then you're not going to get this heat transfer. The image here is showing a window. Um, it's, a, it's a cross section of a window, and it, what it's doing is showing where uh, the, the glass comes up and how we've got these uh, small points of cool air coming in at the joint, which makes sense. The other thing about thermal bridging is I try not to have any plumbing inside any exterior walls. It can go through. It's got to go through sometimes. Um, but again, with a hot and cold pipe running through your wall, it's going to sweat. And it also has a chance to freeze, which is bad news. Um, I was talking a little bit earlier about the... Vapor barrier on the left hand side here is a home that uh, that I'm building or I was building a while ago. I use Intello. Uh, there is a few other breathable vapor barriers around. I like Intello from 475 versus the plastic vapor barrier. The thing about the Intello and the plastic is, or the best analogy I can think of is um, a plastic vapor barrier would be like a dollar store poncho. And an Intello vapor barrier would be like an Arc'teryx technical running jacket. So if you go for a five kilometer run, then you can imagine which which one your body is going to sweat inside of the most. It's going to be the plastic. And so that moisture does happen inside the wall and sometimes on the inside of the house. And anyone who's done any uh, renovations would recognize this picture. Call it an indoor rain event. Let's say you've got three or four people around in your tiny house, and tiny houses are uh, particularly prone to this because they're so small. We're breathing in and out five gallons of moisture every day. So the indoor rain event is when all of that moisture goes to the wall or behind the wall, and it drops down a plastic vapor barrier. There's nowhere else for it to go, and it accumulates behind the baseboard, and that's when we can get mold. And mold really is the enemy um, for health, generally. Whether you've got sensitivities or not, you do not want mold. Um, it never ends up with a good result. The other one is using a humidistat, another way to mitigate mold, especially in the bathroom. So you've got a switch, regular light switch, and a fan switch. You can change out your fan switch and put in what's called a humidistat control. And as soon as the humidity in your bathroom goes above 60, it will just turn on. And sometimes that's going to happen not just when you're having a shower or a bath, um, sometimes it will just turn on because it's the middle of winter and that's the humidity of your tiny house. So trying to keep it below 60 is good. Or windows. I usually use uh, vinyl windows. Uh, aluminum are probably the most, well, wood would be the most non-toxic and then aluminum in the sense that it's a stable 
inert kind of product. Um, but aluminum does uh, sweat. Uh, they can, you can buy them thermally broken, uh, which are quite nice, and they're lightweight. Um, but vinyl is one of my eco compromises. Uh, it's not the cleanest product in the world, but as far as the window material goes, it really does perform well uh, with thermal bridging, install, cost, the whole lot. Uh, yeah, wood's very nice. It's expensive. Um, I've done quite a few with wooden windows, but this this picture here in the corner is the kind of thing that I'm worried about. This is a single glazed window, so that's where the sweating's coming from. His um, insulation, usually I'm using mineral wall, rock sole. Um, wool is another thing that I use in natural building. We we'll use straw bale, uh, but min mineral wool is quite nice in the sense it's just extruded minerals, so they don't have to add fire retardant to it. Not for the rock sole. Um, if you're looking at a fiberglass bat um, from Home Depot or something, um, it will have a fire retardant in it, and the fire retardant is usually where that uh, where you'll get some sort of chemical uh, off gassing. Hemp bat uh, making uh, making a break for it, which is good. <laughs> Wool's nice, very expensive. Gutex wood fiber uh, is it's uh, a natural, breathable version of what you'd use sometimes uh, an XPS foam or something. Um, again, if using steel studs, then this would be a way to thermally break uh, the cold temperature outside to your steel studs. Uh, SIPS panels, I've seen a little bit of talk about SIPS panels today as well, which is great. Um, I don't mind them, uh, but we, you would definitely have to use a ventilation system on the inside to make sure that the off-gassing that's going to occur is taken care of. Spray foam, XPS, Reflectix. People use Reflectix a lot in van conversions, uh, schoolies. Um, it's not technically an ins insulation, and, and uh, anywhere where you've got a non-porous material touching another non-porous material, like the exterior of a of a car or an interior wall of a car, there it will sweat, and that moisture has to go somewhere. Okay, here's my quick spray foam spiel. It doesn't work with wood, I'm afraid, um, and this is uh, maybe the only negative part of the talk that I want to get into. But I really feel uh, called to kind of warn warn people about this. Um, I know that a lot of people use it, but spray foam is a dead material and it's sold to you by the same companies that drop bombs on other countries, chemical companies. They've got a huge lobby behind them saying that it's great. Um, and it is for the first year. After that, it becomes more and more rigid. Um, and the wood doesn't. The wood is still expanding and contracting each season with moisture. So as the wood expands, it pushes the foam out of the way. After it's older, it cracks, like you see in this picture here. Then it contracts again in summer, and now you've got micro cracks between each side of your stud around your whole house. And in those micro cracks can be moisture. You say it's a micro crack because there's not enough uh, space to release that moisture. So it starts breaking down the spray foam and the wood material and making way for mold to grow. Because they say it's a vapor barrier, there's that that uh, that mold and that breaking down of spray foam just comes right into your living space. If you have to use it, use a vapor barrier so that you're able to sequester any of that kind of action away from your living space. Okay, how's my time? Yikes. Ventilation systems. Okay, I've, again, there's been such great information this week, and the there was some talk about propane. I can't remember who was talking about it. Um, Propane does create moisture. It also creates carbon monoxide. So if you're using propane, and it's super common. I mean, I use it all the time um, for my heating loads. If you want to be off-grid, it's it's kind of what you have to do. Make sure you use a carbon monoxide detector. Any tiny house builder will. will. Let's say will. Definitely will use a carbon monoxide detector. Um, ideally, you're going to get a... Uh, a direct vent system. And you can see on this little slide here, that means that it's taking its combustion air from outside, not inside. Um, so they're definitely safer for you in the sense that it's not pulling your oxygen to burn the propane. 
Now, this is my favorite one. And again, super happy that uh, a lot of builders have been talking about it this weekend, but it's called a heat recovery ventilator. And the one that I use is Lunos. There is a few others out there. Um, there's a short and a standard, and I'm just showing there how efficient they are. Now, the way that it works is it breathes out. It comes in a two, two fan system. So there's one fan at each end of your tiny house, ideally one high, one low, but you've got you've got a whole bunch of stuff that you've got to get around. So it doesn't matter too much, um, but as far apart as they can get. So you've got cross ventilation. Now the, what it is, it's the lungs of the house. Um, so one fan will breathe out the warm, stale air. As it breathes out, it heats up that core that you can see just after the fan. It's like a porcelain uh, baffle. It heats it up. And then the fan changes direction and breathes back in the outside fresh air. It goes through the core, it heats up that outside air, and now you've got uh, you 84% efficient heat loss and airflow. Now, when it takes care of the warm, stale air, it's also taking out some of the moisture. So it's it's a really nice system, um, really easy to install. It's about between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars, so around two, two and a half to install. Um, it runs on 12 volt and yeah, amazing, amazing. Okay, EMF, the slide there that you see, uh, that's a Wi Fi router in a home, and the green spot is, is where you've got uh, the EMF uh, radiation emitting from the Wi Fi router. Um, in our place, we turn the Wi-Fi off at night. Um, we're getting bombarded across the street here anyways, but we're not getting bombarded with the green there. We're getting bombarded with more like a red. Um, you can see it, but it's not too, uh, it's uh, not too strong. There's, uh, that's what a cell phone would do to an adult brain. A uh, child's skull, the signal from a cell phone goes all the way through. So these things aren't, very well tested uh, in humans as far as long-term effects still. So I always use these headphones. That's an easy thing for me to do with the cell phone. Um, and then you can buy some meters. I'm not going to suggest any, but if you've got worries about it, uh, that's, uh, that's something you can do. All of the drawings that I do, and I spend 60% of my time doing doing drawings or checking drawings for other builders. Uh, and doing designs for for clients, um, not just in not just with a non toxic uh, theme, but just generally tiny house design. Um, this is something that I include on all of my electrical drawings, which is a note there. Please avoid, please avoid installing electrical wires within this area. So this is the loft of a tiny house, and that's where the bed would be. So especially in a tiny house and any house, really, a tiny bit of extra AC wiring that your electrician needs to go around to avoid, especially your pillow area, let's say three feet around your pillow area. There's no reason to have any electrical outlets there. Um, what you're going to get is this radiation field that you can see in the middle photo there in the power lines. That's, a, that's exactly how a, an AC wire looks um, emitting. Um, now I should have shown it on this one and I might have it on another, but on the lower part of that, on the on the the loft deck there that you can see, is where you'd have lighting for your bathroom or your kitchen or your living room, which is right at your bed as well. So I kind of re recommend using LED wiring for that, and not the kind of LED wiring where you've got a uh, regular Lumex 110 volt wire going to a, a lighting position, and then having a transformer. And then that stepping down to 12 volt DC. I'm sorry if I'm getting a little bit technical here, but what I suggest in areas again around the sleeping spaces or or an area where you're going to be a lot of the time is that you put LED lights that have the wiring of 12 volts running away to a transformer that's out of that space because the transformers do the same thing of emitting radiation as well. Ooh, 10 minutes. And then we've got these different kind of lights, uh, warmths here. I always go for the warm white. Um, if I'm really getting into a nice uh, LED light, then I'm looking for a high percentage CRI, a color rendering index, which is 
the percentage of the spectrum that you get of daylight. So from morning to evening. And it's not saying that that light is going to change in real time with the spectrum, but it's going to try and pick up as much of the light spectrum that we have during the day. So a nice CRA level is 90% or above. Um, and I always try and get the LEDs, uh, DC LEDs that uh, are dimmable because it's, it's just it's just super nice to dim lights. Okay, so material choices. Uh, this is really the best one. If you really want to get into it, then the Living Building Challenge. Um, it's called the Red List. Uh, and that that has a lot of information um, for you guys that are getting really into spreadsheeting out the materials that you're going to put into your tiny house or trying to take care of your, your toxicity. Uh, the, the main one, material choices, if you're walking around Home Depot looking for glues, uh, silicon paint is a, is a huge one, even flooring materials. Like we're looking for the we're looking for the the items that are the big ones and flooring's huge. So if you look for something that's got a low VOC, and that's what that's the VOC is kind of what the off gassing is. Um, if you walk into a house that's just been painted, you can smell the paint and and the, the smell that gets right up your nose <laughs> and into your brain and lasts for half an hour after you've left. That's going to be the VOCs. Okay. We made it. There's some details there for me. Um, these are a couple of homes that I did. On the left-hand side was the first home that I did, uh, which had MGO board on the walls. Um, it was had a clay plaster after that. The whole house was built from one poplar tree, which was milled and and uh, milled up into the different uh, and stuff, the different materials that we needed. T and G. Uh, stud materials, all of that stuff. It was a beautiful home. And then on the right hand side there is is uh, is the most recent uh, tiny house that we did. And uh, Bryce did a pretty kick ass video of it, which was great on his YouTube channel. But uh, just in the last few minutes here, and maybe I'll I'll r roll through a little bit. We'll see how we go. Um, I'm totally happy to answer any questions. What do I think of bamboo? Uh, I love bamboo. I think it's it's a little heavy, but super solid. Um, it's pretty. It's a really sustainable product. Like it grows fast. Um, there's quite a lot of glue in it, but again, there is quite good glues coming out. Um, now, what was the? Oh, yeah. There's a plywood that they sell at Home Depot, and the names just jumped out of my head. But that uses almost the most non-toxic formaldehyde-free glue there is. Um, I just saw a question there float by from Kim about formaldehyde. Yeah, formaldehyde's being s phased out for sure. Uh, oh, well, you have to look at Home Depot for the plywood. Uh, let's see here. I know. I'm sorry for the spray foam, Dave. Dave, it's. I mean, let's say this is my opinion, and it's anecdotal in the sense of that's what I've seen happen. Um, there's some bigger insulation companies that do that same sort of spiel on spray foam, and they usually get sued immediately by Dow or BASF or those companies. Is there a cheaper way to achieve good ventilation? <laughs> yeah, I know. It is an expensive appliance, the Lunos. Um, and I didn't really talk about ceiling fans too much. Definitely put a ceiling fan over your cooking area. Definitely put a ceiling fan in your bathroom. Um, I didn't get to talk a whole lot about... Uh, I mean, a ceiling fan is also great. Um, a lot of people say, well, I'll just open a window in winter. I mean, in Canada, that's a really nice idea, but not many people do that. If you've been uh, if you've been uh, spending money or time trying to heat your house, if you get a wood burning stove, essential oil mold spray in glass spray bottle combine ten drops of oregano oil, thyme, clove oil. That's the one for mold for sure. Clove oil, good ingredients. Yeah, thanks, Loretta. About wool insulation, we talked about wool insulation earlier. 
uh, just before the call started. Uh, yeah, it was amazing. It's it's the most natural, let's say, it's straws or so an insulation, but not you're not going to use it in a tiny house. It's expensive. Uh, the install feels a bit funny if you're used to if you're a builder and you're used to installing bats. Um, wool takes about three times longer. So there's definitely a cost to wool, um, both on the material uh, cost itself, but then also the installation. Um, I learned the hard way with that a couple of times. <laughs> um, but if you're doing it yourself, wool's great. If you're really doing a van conversion or something like that, a schoolie or, or a, uh, like a sprinter van or something, then wool is really a great solution there. Because unless you're going to spray foam it out, um, to to create a tight seal uh, along your metal edges uh, where it's going to sweat, then wool on that edge is less likely to mold, and it's uh, and it can deal with the moisture. Like it's not going to change the R value too much, the insulation value, um, when wool is wet. Whereas other insulations will just be destroyed forevermore. And I I guess I did say that with uh, spray foam and and to put a positive spin on the spray foam. Uh, if you're doing a shipping container, or if you really want to get into it with a VAD conversion, then spray foam is the one. Um, anything that you've got a dead material that you're using, steel studs, spray foam, uh, steel studs, shipping container, or the interior of a car wall, then spray foam is great. And then the only thing that I'd say about that would be, um, make sure that you've got good ventilation. Just so as the spray foam goes through its natural off-gassing cycle, you're replacing that air in your house every couple of minutes with fresh air. Having fresh air quality, having air quality inside the same as outside is the key, really. Uh, name of Bryce's video, it's on my website, tidyhealthyhomes.com in the portfolio section. Uh, he's done a few of mine, which is great. We've been friends for a while. We met at Burning Man in New Zealand a while ago. Uh, thanks, Terry. Nice to meet you. I was wondering the same, Ellie. Let me scroll and have a look here what the questions are. What is the best? So what is best after wool insulation, Dave? Dave, I use Roxol. It's the best. Uh, it's low toxicity. It's easy to use. Um, it's stable. It doesn't like slough down in the wall. Uh, and it's available everywhere and pretty cheap. Yeah, that's a good compromise. It won't break the bank. Biogas or alcohol stoves. I don't have any experience apart from just noting out, um, looking at biogas digesters and stuff, slowly making their way to market in an, in an effective way. Uh, radiant floor heat in a tiny. Yeah, Rebecca. Well, I'm doing one at the moment, which is uh, like an electric heat mats. I think there's, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five heat mats in the design. It's a little bit of a power hog, but in floor heating is the most natural way to heat a house for sure. Um, forced air is blowing air all over the place. It's not normal. If you go outside, we just have ambient heat, which is what radiant floor gives you. So if you can make it work, awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, Terry, wondering the same. Oh, Terry. Okay. My time's almost up, and I'll have a little chat after for anyone who's got burning questions. But uh, thanks so much for stopping by my house and the festival. And hopefully there was information that gave you guys some confidence to move forward. Stay safe in your houses. And yeah, please check out my feeds, my show, uh, Instagram, Facebook. And if you need help with design, then that's what I do. Awesome. I'm not sure who was next after me. Let's see. Who is next? Oh, Lindsay. Awesome. I'll have a listen to Lindsay as well. Uh, Terry's question was, if you consult other builders, I do, 
Uh, I've done a fair bit of consulting with Mint Tiny House. They're just down the road here. Uh, a really great builder. Um, like a, just really nice people in the office. They're cranking out like one tiny house a week. So there's been a few tiny houses that, that I've designed that people want me to build that look exactly like a mint tiny house. Um, so in those cases, it's really, they build, if it, if it looks like a mint tiny house, then they should build it. So um, in those cases, I've talked to my client, I've talked to mint and we, we find a, a nice medium. So um, I, I like working with other builders because then I get to, kind of do a little bit of education there and, and some ideas about what I think a tiny, like a, a healthy home is. So Mint's getting quite good at it. Um, and if it looks close to one of their models, then, then I'll get them to do it. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now is a bit more custom. So yeah, I do consult and I do plans for other builders too. I'll have a look at their electrical plans and tweak them a little bit. Um, and not just for tiny houses. I do houses around Vancouver and and this and that as well. I do some natural building designs for people, straw bale and cob and this and that. Yeah. Thanks, Ali. Oh, man, there's still 140 people. <laughs> uh, can you talk more on water system, rainwater collection, compost, etc.? Gabby, hey. Oh, yes. Uh, water system, rainwater collection. Depending on your climate, you can get enough water off a tiny house roof. Usually, let's say, in, well, here in BC, you can. Um, on the coast where I am, it's essentially a rainforest. Um, what about it? If there's water coming off the roof, uh, then I'll use a rainwater diversion, uh, first flush diverter before it goes into the tank. So you could look that up. Um, it's a nice little system that the first flush means that the water's coming, the rain's hitting the roof, and that first uh, flush of water off the roof goes separately to a pipe that drips away. Uh, that pipe fills up, and then it continues onto the tank. What that does is get rid of, like, the bird poop, uh, the leaves, the dust, that stuff off the roof. So that's a nice system. Usually I'm going to put in a, as big a tank as I think I can collect water in because we do have now in this rainforest uh, at least a month every year where it doesn't rain at all. So the bigger your tank, the more collection you can get in winter, the better. Uh, if you can bury the tank or coat the tank, uh, if you're in the country, it's a very good idea. Um, I'm from Australia, and one of the most devastating things apart from fire itself and I'm sure the same happened in California and rural areas is you see all these melted water tanks everywhere. It's exactly what you need at that time of year. So if you can get it fireproof, it's good. Uh, compost. Yes. Compost. I can talk about this stuff forever. Um, compost systems. So that it's a big thing with, uh, with tiny houses. We've got, we've got our gray water and we've got our black water. So usually I'm putting in, in a, a composting toilet. Usually it's a separate. Um, and so the separate has a urine diverter that goes to gray water. The poop goes into the bucket. You've got to deal with that separately. But then we've got another input there, which is the kitchen sink. If you're, if you're into permaculture, you're into gardening, and you're interested in being uh, part of the ecosystem, then a vermiculture is a great system to run your kitchen water through before it goes to gray water. If you run your gray, your kitchen water as part of the gray water system and you're just dumping it into like a outlaw drain or a French drain into the ground, it's, it's going to stink up after a while because of the fats and the food particles in that kitchen uh, from that kitchen sink. So if you can run it through a worm bin first, the worms will clean up all the fats. They love it. You get some compost tea as a result, and then the water going into your grey water is much better to dump into the ground. I don't think I can actually suggest dumping water directly into the ground, but a lot of people do it. Terry's question was if you consult other builders. Yeah, I got that one, I think. Uh, rainwater collection, composts. Great information. Thanks, Wendy. Roxol. Yep. Terry. 
Da, da, da. Any chance you'll be able to do a sauna or steam room with a bath in a with a bathroom with HRV or an extra one? Oh, there is another. Lunos has another system which is a bit more robust. I think it it's not the E two, but it's designed for bathrooms. The the Lunos fan system, uh, the E E two, isn't actually designed for bathrooms, and that's just got to do with the internal workings of it and the way that it drops moisture and this and that. The Lunos does have a very efficient um, HRV uh, system that can. Uh, that might work in a sauna. You definitely need the heat recovery if you want to have a proper sauna. Uh, you want to waterproof that really, really carefully, for sure. Thanks, Zach. Here's the video. Oh, thanks, Lisa. Okay. I should probably clear the way for the other speakers, but please feel free to email me through my website, Instagram, Facebook. All that stuff. Um, I'll just maybe take one more question here. Nah, everyone's just saying thanks. Thank you all.